Hi, this is Raymond Solder. Tim LaHaye and Craig Parshall and their book, Thunder of Heaven, a Joshua Jordan novel, the end series, book two. You know, this is, this is Ray. This is like a, a cliffhanger, like the old time cereals. And I don't mean Rice Krispies. I mean at the movie theater, where they would run about 13 episodes of Flash Gordon or someone else, and always at the end of each of the 13 until the end, it looked like he couldn't make it. He was going to die. Now let's see what this. why I said that. This is the end of the chapter with... We've just read. Just a few miles outside the testing parameter, a small group of hikers was sitting in front of a small portable satellite monitor watching the picture. Even though it was a little scrambled, they could make out the image of Joshua Jordan climbing into a jeep next to Colonel Kinney. One of the hikers, speaking in perfect Persian, said to his fellow Iranians, There he is. Jordan is the civilian. You see him? Then he added, Give the command. What on earth is going to happen? Chapter 42 Iranian Airspace. Joel was at the head of the formation of Israeli F-16 fighter bombers. They were flanked by a protection squadron of F-15s. They were flying low, Paris, uh, periously low, at 90 feet above the desert floor. In the valley between the Carcass Mountains, they were hoping to avoid any ground radar within a 20-mile radius. At the speed they were traveling, they would reach Iran's Natanz nuclear launch facility and drop their bombs before Iran, Iran's anti-aircraft missiles were ready to launch. They would have loved to have had the new American F-35 jets, but the U.S. government balked at giving Israel the new fighters. David, flying on Joel's starboard, noticed something and laughed. Below, a goat herder, who had heard the roar of the low-flying jets and must have thought the sky was falling, was sprawling spread eagle on the hard scrabble ground surrounded by his herd. Let's hope he doesn't have a cell phone, David quipped. Okay, final checkpoint approaching. Joel radioed back to the formation behind him. So far, the flight had been uneventful, which was surprising. Maybe this would be a repeat of the Israel's bombing of Saddam Hussein's nuclear facility in Iraq in 1981. They'd used a similar flight plan Back then, the IAF launched a surprise attack and swept over the location, bombed it, and got out without a scratch. Check your radar detection receivers and keep your eye on this circle on your screen for the incoming missiles nearest you. Joel checked his flight deck clock. Right about now, they're probably scrambling their jets. He knew that the Iranians had the newest generation of Russian MiG fighters, but the F-15s would be able to handle them. Command had calculated the time that would be needed for the Iranians to prepare their anti-aircraft missile controls and then home in on the incoming jets, if they were lucky. Okay, 
everybody. Let's get in the welded wing formation. Tighten up, folks. The jets pulled into a near wing tip to wing tip position. Just a matter of moments now until the strike. The large buildings of the Natanz facility came into sight in the distance. Since most of the centrifuges and uranium enrichment equipment were underground, the F-16s were carrying super bunker busters that would crack the ground wide open and blow down deep enough to destroy everything, including the nuclear launch missiles they were told were in the adjacent silos. Joel only knew what IDF command had told him. Those in charge of the operation, like General Shapiro, had to rely on intelligence information from people like Rafi, their own clandestine agent in Jordan, and Yosef, the Iranian insider whose motivation was un unimpeachable. He needed to rescue his brother and sister from an Israeli prison. But there was something the pilots didn't know, any of them. As each of the bomber pilots hit the drop buttons to let loose their deadly payload, their flight deck radar detection screens lit up one circle two circles, three circles. We've been painted, Joel cried out. Trooping, get out! Now the sky was filled with anti-aircraft missiles, dozens of them, maybe hundreds. Joel dropped his bombs and pulled his F-16 skyward. But something, a red flash, caught his eye to the starboard. It was from the ball of fire from the missile strike that had just decimated David's F-16. No parachute, no escape. I'm hit! Another F-15 pilot screamed up on the radio. Below, Joel saw bright explosions from the fighter jets of his team being destroyed, one after another. His radar showed three Iranian MiGs fast on his tail. Everything had gone wrong. Miles away, in another part of Iran, at the nuclear launch site at Boucher, the facility that the UN and the IE, IAEA had declared to be safe and used only for public energy purposes. The chief of operations and his officers were cheering wildly. Allah Akbar! The plan had worked. Yosef and Rafi had been deliberately duped. The site at Nantes had been abandoned and the equipment moved to tunnels in the mountains. The empty facility was a piece of dramatic stage dressing, military theater. The real nuclear launch commands and the silos loaded with nuclear warheads at Boucher were untouched. When Iranian intelligence grew suspicious that some of the local citizens in Bouchard might try to filter information to the West about the nuclear missile site, they evacuated the entire city, forcing the residents to move out. Iranian nuclear command would take no chances. The Bouchard facility was just too valuable. The Iranian chief of operations smiled now as he thought of the gift of good fortune 
concerning the useless Israeli strike against Natanz. Thank you, Israel. Now we could launch our nuclear warheads at you, and we could claim though to the whole world it was self-defense. Old City, Jerusalem Deborah Jordan couldn't take it in fast enough. The narrow cobblestone streets, the women and head coverings picking out of small windows, the crowds of pilgrims and tourists, and merchants selling leather goods or dates laid out in trays. I've always wanted to come here, she said, especially this, the Via Della Rosa. This is unbelievable. This route, the way of the cross, the path taken by Jesus on the way to the crucifixion, almost. Deborah stammered and couldn't finish. Esther McKinney, the colonel's wife, was bright-eyed and smiling at her young visitor. We thought you'd appreciate it. Esther stopped them in the middle of the narrow street. Now, turn around and look up. When she did, Deborah recognized an ancient, graceful stone arch connecting the buildings on either side. Now imagine, you are here, 2,000 years ago. Make the stores and buildings disappear. Tradition says that this Roman arch is the place, or at least near the place, where Pilate appeared with Jesus. The Gospel of John makes it clear. The Roman government had allowed Jesus to be found guilty, though he admitted there was no evidence for it. Then he ordered him to be scourged. The Roman guards mocked Jesus and rammed a crown of thorns down on his head, beat him, and laid a purple robe on his back which had been torn open by the whip and was bleeding. Then Pontius Pilate said to those in attendance, Behold the man. Deborah was silent. Her face showed her astonishment. Esther said, But Pilate was only half right. He forgot the other part. Which part? He should have said, Behold, the Son of God. Deborah smiled. It's interesting I'm here now. The place at this point in my life. I've been a Christian for a while. Received Christ as a teenager, but lately I've been wondering about things. My life, plans, People. People? Well, there's this guy. Esther laughed loudly. Yes! <laughs> there's always a guy, isn't there? So I've got some things to work out. I need to take things to the Lord. I need some guidance. Then she looked at Esther. Must be hard on you being Jewish here in Israel, as deeply involved in the government as your husband is, yet both of you also being, also being Messianic Christians too, believing that Jesus, Yeshua, is the promised one, the once and for all sacrificial lamb, offered up to take away the sins of the world for all who trust in him. Yes, it's not been easy. 
But who says any of this is supposed to be easy? It's supposed to be true and right. Yes, it's a sensitive issue. We handle it with discretion. Clint doesn't wear Jesus Saves t-shirts to work, if you know what I mean. Esther looked at her watch, then she checked her cell phone. Deborah, have you received a call from your father in the last hour? No, why? Well, probably nothing. Clint usually calls about this time each day. It's a routine we have because of the way things are. Clint and I have a joke. We say living in Israel is like the thorn trees, lovely from a distance, but painful at close quarters. Life in Israel is beautiful, but precarious. Clint and Josh were at a remote testing site today, but should have been back by now. Deborah pulled out her all phone and dialed her father's private number. It rang ten times and then went to voicemail. No answer, she said. Deborah thought she caught something in Esther's expression, a vague look of apprehension. The next moment Esther said, Let's keep walking. So much to see. Yeah, I know a great place for lunch. Chapter 43, Tehran, Iran. Joshua cried out. Somewhere in his numbness and confusion, he felt searing pain. He couldn't locate it at first. His body was not on the ground. He thought he was flying. No, 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 that wasn't it. I'm hanging. Joshua Jordan struggled to see where he was. As he did, he located the source of his torturing pain. In each of his shoulders, they were pinned behind him in a hog-tie fashion. He was hanging from a wall. The tips of his feet were barely touching the concrete floor. His, close, or his chest had been stripped bare, and his shoes and socks were off. He blinked and shook his head, trying to clear the cobwebs. Think back. Think back. What happened? Started coming back. He had been climbing into the jeep with Colonel Kinney. The other members of the IDF team had already left the testing site. He remembered seeing the dust from their trucks ahead. Then from somewhere behind them, an Israeli Apache helicopter came swooping down. It landed 50 feet away. A man wearing an IDF uniform came striding out with two other soldiers, and he said, Colonel Jordan, urgent message. The man in the IDF uniform held out a piece of paper. Joshua climbed out of the jeep as Kenny yelled to him to stop. Then one of the soldiers dropped to a kneeling position close enough that Joshua could see the soldier was aiming a strange-looking handgun at him. Joshua turned back to the jeep. Then something struck Joshua in the back of the thigh. He grasped for it. A dart protruded from his skin. He tried to run, but the dizziness stopped him. He dragged his feet as if they were cinder blocks. Gunshots, a lot of them, were being fired. He saw Clint Kinney firing back fiercely from the ground 
next to the Jeep, and then Kenny was hit and went down. Joshua fell into the vehicle, found the other handgun with the clip already in. He turned clumsily and started firing toward the helicopter, emptying the clip. Someone yelped in pain, but Joshua couldn't hold on. The pistol dropped from his hand. He was blacking out. The last thing he remembered was a bearded man bending over him and laughing. Now Joshua was in a concrete room hanging from a hook. There was enough light for him to get an idea of where he was. There was a drain in the middle of the floor and bloodstains. This place of cruelty had been used recently. Then he heard voices outside. One guy asked, Then the man answered something about being okay, but his wife was sick. They were making small talk. Joshua recognized the language. Persian Farsi, the language of Iran. Years before, when he'd been running spy plane flyovers to document Iran's nuclear facilities, the Pentagon had taught him some Farsi in case he was shot down and captured. That never happened, though there was a story behind that, too. Although Josh was feeling lightheaded and woozy with pain, he found himself floating back to that distant point in time, to that last time he'd flown his newest generation U-2. He'd been alone in the bubble, thousands of feet above Iran, with only the sound of his breathing in his mask. Inhale, exhale. Then he spotted the sight he clicked on the high-speed cameras in the belly of the aircraft. They had crystal clear photo acuity so that when the digital photos were downloaded, you'd practically be able to measure the size of the bolts on the girders of the nuclear plant. Then the call came in. Hollywood one, Hollywood one, you've been made abort. Get out of there. But he didn't abort. He wanted to finish the mission. He shouldn't have made it out alive, but only later did he find out why he had. A noise snapped him out of his reverie. The metal door to the room swung open. Three men strode in. The guy in the front had a neatly trimmed beard and wore the uniform of an officer in Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Next to him was a large soldier. I am Captain Akbar, the officer announced. You are our prisoner. We need some information. Another man dressed as a civilian in a suit, step forward. Colonel Jordan, the Iranian Atomic Energy Organization, simply wishes to supply safe energy, electricity, modern conveniences to our people. But today, Israel bombed one of our facilities at Nantaz a ruthless act of aggression. We have the sovereign right to protect ourselves. If you can answer some simple questions, then we will let you go. You will be safely returned to your family. Joshua tried to lift his head to see the man. The civilian from the IAEO continued. 
We just want some data so we can protect ourselves. Nothing more. We mean no harm. Joshua growled in a hoarse voice. Then why is there blood on the floor? The soldier standing guard off to this side had a metal rod in his hand, and he stepped forward, but the officer stopped him. There's plenty of time for that. The civilian asked, Have you supplied Israel with your return to sender technology? No answer. I will ask it again. Again, Joshua didn't answer. Now the big soldier was given the go-ahead. He stepped forward and lifted Joshua's head so he could stare at him in the, right in the face. Then, smiling a wide grin, the soldier took a stick and rammed it up, butt end, into Joshua's solar plexus. Joshua gasped for air, unable to breathe or scream in pain. Spittle ran down his mouth as he convulsed. The civilian said to the officer, We have a tight schedule. We need this information immediately. You understand? The officer nodded. Don't worry. We'll get it. Hawk's Nest Colorado. When Abigail received the call from General Shapiro in Tel Aviv, it was early afternoon, Mountain Standard Time. She vaguely knew who General Shapiro was, but her heart dropped like a brick when she heard his voice. After all these years, expecting a call or a knock on the door, while Josh had run dangerous missions, or tested new aircraft, a call never came. But today, it did. I regret to inform you, Mrs. Jordan, that your husband has gone missing in the Negev desert. Missing? I don't understand. His convoy was attacked. The attackers were dressed like Israeli soldiers. We believe he's been taken hostage. By who? Where is he now? Our best intelligence is that he is now somewhere inside Iran. We believe the Iranian government is behind this. The American Embassy. Have you contacted them or the Pentagon? We have contacted the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency and the Pentagon. What are they doing about it? We have every confidence that they will assist us in trying to locate and extract your husband. Her words were trembling. Oh, dear God, please protect my husband. Then in the next breath she asked General Shapiro, Deborah, my daughter. She said she's with Colonel Kinney's wife, Esther. I have to get over there, General, to Israel. I wouldn't advise that, Mrs. Jordan. A rescue plan, we need one immediately. We're working on that. I promise we will keep you informed minute by minute. Shapiro had no more information. When Abigail hung up, she stood in the middle of the big family room and shrieked Cal's name. He had been working close by outside, repairing a section of broken railing on the big wraparound porch. Now that his father was overseas, he was taking care of a few repairs that his dad had planned on doing. Cal sprinted through the front door. He found his mother with her hands over her face, shaking as she sobbed. Abigail 
blurted it through her tears. You, your dad's in trouble. He's been grabbed by a terrorist. They think he's being held hostage in Iran. Cal reeled and his face drained. When he caught his breath, he asked, Who's going to get him out? The Israelis are working on it. They're waiting to hear from Washington. Abigail wiped her eyes and tried to take a deep breath. She and Cal locked eyes. Instinctively, they had the same thought. Cal voiced it first. No way, Mom. We can't wait for the politicians or the White House. They've been gunning for Dad. They'll let him twist in the wind. Exactly. I'm calling Rocky Bridger. He was invaluable during your crisis at Grand Central Station. How about John Gallagher? Can't afford to take him off task. What's... What's he doing for us right now is critical to American security. So, is true then? What Gallagher had me researching about Russia, a nuclear threat? For Abigail, it all fell together. Cal's working on his computer. His desire to contribute to the roundtable effort she offered him a simple reply to his question. Yes, it's true. As she looked at her son, she knew that a convergence of circumstances had now brought him into the inner sanctum. She also knew that there were no accidents, not in a universe governed by a god who directed the destinies of people as well as nations. Welcome to the round table, she said. Chapter 44 John Gallagher gunned his rental car toward Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. After getting off I-64, he streaked up Interstate 81 at 85 miles an hour. He hoped the state police we're busy stopping everybody else. Ken Leary called. Okay, I got into the archives, read the reports. Several spots in the valley were mentioned. Go down the list. Jeez, oh jeez, I hope we're not too late. The key was to isolate the one that the Russians thought was truly a blast from the past. Gallagher and Leary agreed on one, which seemed to be the best from a strategic standpoint. It was just off I-81, about 10 minutes by car from I-66, which led directly to downtown Washington. But Gallagher also knew that if he placed all his eggs in one basket and lost the bet on which basket, he was about to lose hundreds of thousands of lives. The U.S. Capitol and most of the American government in the bargain. To make matters worse, Gallagher felt like he was doing that balancing act while running a gunny sack race. Thanks, Graham. Gotta go. Gallagher fished through his private book of phone numbers till he came across a retired FBI guy by the name of Frank Trumuth. Gallagher remembered that Frank had bought a place in the Shenandoah when he left the bureau and was doing something folksy, like being a fishing guide or something. The last case they had worked together was in North Carolina, busting up a terror cell that was smuggling drugs to finance their plans 
to then bomb bridges in major cities during rush hour. He, he voiced his voice, called the number into his all phone while driving. It rang at the other end. It kept ringing. Then he heard a voicemail. Hi, this is Doris and Frank. We want to talk, and so do you, so leave a message. Frank, hey, John Gallagher here. Retired from the Bureau just like you. You may have heard. How's the fishing? Say, got an emergency here. Don't want to overplay my hand, but I really, really need to talk to you. ASAP. Please, buddy. Give me a ring pronto. Okay. As Gallagher flew up the interstate, he knew that Frank Trimuth was the only play he had left. Sure, Gallagher had some other backup plans if Frank was unavailable. But in the light of day, they all looked tragically stupid. For a fleeting second, he thought I left the FBI. So why am I still trying to save the world? But as quickly as he asked that question, he answered it. Because it's worth saving. Tehran, Iran. Yosef Abbas was running for his life. He'd abandoned his apartment as soon as he heard about the Israeli attack on the Nantes facility, and now the whole thing had been a setup. He realized he'd been played for a pawn by the Iranian leadership. That meant that Iran's ruthless, moist agents were onto him and would be looking for him at that very moment. He stuck to the back alleys of Tehran as he walked, trying to figure out where he could go. He'd received several calls from Israeli Mossad contact, but he didn't pick up. Of course, no messages were left. He never trusted the Israelis completely. Now he couldn't trust anyone in the Iranian government. That left him only one option. He needed a safe house. He only knew of one place, even though he knew all the reasons why this place might spell death for him, too. He walked to an entryway of, off the alley, opened the blue-painted door, and climbed the stairs. And at the top, he knocked three times, then twice more. The door opened. A familiar face from his university days was in the doorway. So, Yosef Ebas, the other man is smiling. You finally decided to join the CDCI. Yosef shrugged as he entered the apartment. On the wall was a poster that read, the CDCI, Agents of Change. Underneath that, it read, Committee for Democratic Change in Iran. A few miles from the apartment was a nondescript two-story building that had once been a warehouse. The government of Iran had converted it into a secret prison, a place for, for, the, for the forgotten, the forlorn, and the brutalized enemies of Iran. That was where Joshua Jordan was being held, in the third cell from the end on the second floor. His innards had been punched in with a metal rod the bottoms of his feet beaten, and finally he had been strapped in a crude electric chair and shocked repeatedly. 
When they tossed him back into his cell, he was out cold for several hours. And when he regained consciousness, he thought he'd been roused by someone talking to him. He was slowly aware of several voices. Some talking, others yelling, all in Farsi, except one. Kredit the voice said. Oh, wait a minute, excuse me. Colonel Jordan, the voice said, cutting through the din, and in the English of an educated Iranian. The voice had a strange nasal quality to it. There's a bowl of water in your cell. You should take it. Be sure and hydrate. You must avoid dehydration. Joshua dragged himself slowly and extremely painfully over to the clay bowl that had some putrid water in it. He tried to use only his hands and wrists to pull himself along because his arms felt as they may have been dislocated. But he couldn't pick up the bowl. He lapped the stale water like a dog. The voice went on. It seems they want you to drink water like a dog. They're trying to reduce you to a dog. With great effort, Joshua rolled over onto his side to check out his cell. It was concrete with bars on one wall facing the hallway and a solid metal door with some kind of small window in it. He rolled onto his back and stared at the ceiling. You speak English. A lot of the educated Iranians do, said the voice, which Joshua now realized was coming from, the, from a nearby cell. Who are you? Dr. Hermos Abdu. I wish you were in my cell. I need a medical doctor. No, I'm not that kind of doctor. Sorry. How do you know who I am? I hear things. Why are you here? I'm what you might call an enemy of the state, but a friend of the Iranian people. Joshua knew he couldn't afford to trust anybody. They'd tried to break him in a short amount of time, using a rapid torrent of pain. No chance for something like waterboarding. When he was flying for the Air Force, they had taught him how to endure that. But he had figured out the reason for the quick, dirty, maximum pain routine they were using. Iran was obviously planning a retaliatory strike against Israel. They needed to know the specifics of the RTS missile defense system that was in place, and they needed it quick. Joshua figured he just needed to hold on through the torture for a short period of time. On the other hand, once the attack was launched, what reason would the Iranians have to keep him alive? He thought about that. He had already made up his mind. I don't want to die. He had so much to live for. Now it seemed more than ever, and so much left undone. Not just his official business, with the round table, or even his defensive weapons designs that he sincerely believed could protect innocent life. More than that, his wife, his precious son, and his daughter, Abby, ever seeking to please a father who regrettably was so hard to please his headstrong, 
Deb. Yet he knew there was something even beyond all of those things that he would have to deal with. A force that had been pursuing him, making him choose his course as if he were in the middle of a crossroads in a strange land. He felt he'd become a fugitive. But from what? His life seemed to be closing in on him like the walls of his filthy cell. So he needed to survive this. But Joshua had a tactical worry. What if the Iranian Revolutionary Guard had planted this friendly prisoner, this Dr. Abdu, just to gain his confidence? Time was short and he had no time to take a chance. Joshua asked, Why should I trust you? The other man laughed, but it really wasn't from amusement, more from irony, perhaps. If you could see me, then you would understand. Besides, Colonel Jordan, I have a secret, and it can save you. Chapter 45. U.S. Secretary of Defense Roland Allenworth had traveled in the White House to discuss the Joshua Jordan hostage situation. He had been able to, unable to meet with President Corlin, so he was led to the Situation Room. When he walked in, the only people there were Vice President Telrude and Corlin's Chief of Staff, Hank Strand. Ellenworth wasn't pleased. Where's the president? There's been an incident, Tilruth said. Then she nodded to Strand. The chief of staff said, As you know, the president has been in poor health. That's nothing new. Where is he? When, when can I talk with him? This can't wait. I'm afraid that won't be possible. He's in a coma. Happened very suddenly. He passed out again, and this time he didn't wake up. The look on Ellenworth's face said it all. He never liked Tulrud, but she'd been a non-issue at first, particularly because Ellenworth worked directly with Corland as a member of his cabinet. He had wondered sometimes why Corland had picked him, and in the beginning Ellenworth had been a staunch advocate for the Pentagon, and many of his positions diverged from Corland's internationalist tendencies. But things had changed over the last year. Cornland and he had begun to work well together. Allenworth had always feared Tulroot's politics, her lust for power, and her constant deference to the international community of nations. Now his worst fears were being realized. Allenworth asked the obvious question, do, do I call you Madam President? Tilruth said, We will be executing the constitutional transfer of power shortly. Excuse my bluntness, but this needs to be done quickly if what you're telling me is true. Tilruth's eyes glinted with an inner explosion. Are you questioning my honesty, Mr. Secretary of Defense? No, only the medical judgment of those who say the president is unable to execute the duties of the presidency. Well, that's not your call to make, is it? I suppose not. What is your question, Roland? 
It's about Joshua Jordan. The Israeli government has indicated that during a test run of the RTS missile defense system, Jordan was taken hostage and is presently inside Iran. I don't have to tell you how sensitive this situation is. Jordan possesses vital American defense information. You mean vital if, if we continue to use his RTS technology? Of course. But not vital if we discontinue using the RTS. Well, that would be a reversal of policy. Maybe yes, maybe no. But that's my call to make now that I will be assuming executive powers. But if our enemies acquire the RTS design, they could create their own return to sender laser shields. Well, if we don't lob missiles at them, then the RTS formula won't do them much good. If you'll excuse me for saying so, that would represent a preposterous approach to national defense. Well, to answer your first point, no. I won't excuse you. And secondly, I won't authorize any participation in any attempt to rescue Mr. Jordan, at least not at present. Things are much too delicate in our negotiations with Iran and Iran's partners among the Arab League to jeopardize things with some harebrained scheme to try to get Jordan out. What about Israel's interests? What about America's interests? We both know about that Israel airstrike against Iran's installations. Iran fended them off. The entire Middle East is destabilized thanks to the decisions made in Tel Aviv. And you want me to worry about Israel? She picked up a stack of news releases. You see what the Internet dailies are saying? Israel provokes Mideast war. Naked Israeli aggression. Massive strike against Iran. Now, do you want more? After that, Alan Worth had stormed out of the White House. Now he was back at his office. He assigned his assistant secretary the distasteful task of advising the Israeli government that the United States would be unable at present to participate in any direct action to accomplish the immediate rescue of Joshua Jordan. However, the United States will work through the Department of State to open up a dialogue with Iran and hopefully affect his release in the future. In Tel Aviv, General Shapiro received the message from the U.S. Defense Department. He could only shake his head in disgust. Israel was in a state of high alert. The mission to proactively prevent Iran from launching a nuclear attack against Israel had been a disastrous failure. Now Israel had only one option, to brace for Iran's brutal counterattack on the Israeli homeland. Israel was busy marshalling all of its military assets in hopes of stopping the inevitable. Shapiro delivered the news to the chief of staff for the Israeli Defense Forces. The chief, in turn, pulled together his strategic team for an emergency briefing. It appears 
the chief announced, that the return to sender system may now have an even greater significance for the defense of Israel, which is interesting, considering the fact that it is designer is now being held hostage in a jail somewhere in Tehran, according to our intelligence. Should we divert our attention from the task at hand, which is the, the defense of our very lives, homes, and families, to rescue him? What information will be he be forced to divulge if we don't? And yet even now, the Iranians have already extracted strategic design plans from Jordan, including the details of Israel's own version of RTS. Don't bank on that, General. The voice came from the speakerphone. It was Clinton Kenny from his hospital bed, recuperating from the two bullets that had pierced his chest, one lodging in, in a rib and another in his lung. Jordan's only been in custody for a day, a day and a half if you count it all. I don't care what they've done to him up to now. The group around the table at IDF command considered what they just heard. Then Kenny added, the plain fact is that Joshua Jordan hasn't spilled his guts to the Iranians. At least not yet. I'd bet my life on it. The last thing Abigail asked Victoria at Hawk's Nest was to relay a desperate request to her husband, Pack to get a group of trained men to New York City to stop the portable nuke attack. Victoria had called Abigail back to relay her husband's response. Abby, it's in the works. Pack has deployed a small force of operatives to New York State as we speak. We received the expense money wired to the operations account. Thanks for that. One thing you need to know, Pack won't be concerned, and Pack won't be considered a part of this. The Patriots are not part of this. Our men on the ground know only that you, as de facto leader of the Round Table, are the one directing and authorizing this offensive. If things go bad, Victoria didn't have to finish the sentence. Abigail knew only too well the nightmare in store for her if this privately funded strike force of paramilitary agents were unsuccessful or if innocent lives were lost in the attempt or if they were just plain wrong about the threat to begin with. She was walking the utter line of treason in a desperate attempt to save her country. Now Abigail was on the phone with retired Army General Rocky Bridger. She'd explained Josh's desperate situation as a captive of the Iranians she knew this wasn't the first hostage situation Bridger had encountered. Abigail, if you tried to reach your friend in the Patriots group about Joshua being captured, yes, and I can't get through. Abigail knew, of course, that Pack Henry was at some unnamed location in Paris knee-deep in surveillance of the Russian offensive. When Abigail told Rocky Bridger that the Patriots 
were out of the mix. Bridger had only one plan for the rescue of Joshua. Abby, I'm going to call together some special ops guys that I know. They're all out of active service now, but well-trained, good men. If I ask them, they might just lend a hand. But I need some pretty powerful intel about where they're keeping Joshua. Maps of the area, scouting reports, structural details about the building itself. Abigail understood. I'm going to give you General Shapiro's international number in Israel. He's my contact. If anyone would know that information, it would be him. Cal had been sitting next to his mother during the call. And when she clicked off the phone, he opened up. Okay, Mom. First things first. We need to pray. Now there's an intelligent boy. And uh, that's the end of this section. We'll be going to chapter 46 next. And I don't know about you, but I am intrigued, very intrigued with this story. <laughs>